You know, if you happen to find yourself sitting at some time in a group of, of women where one has recently become pregnant, you know what's going to happen. It won't take long until the, the conversation moves to the topic of baby, right? We will be there and listen to an ongoing conversation about baby. Mothers who have already given birth will begin to recount their birth experiences. There, there will be questions of nursery colors. There will be what I would call nauseating details of nausea. <laughs> Inevitably, the question will come, are you going to learn the sex of your child before birth? When's your ultrasound? Those kinds of things will come up. You'll probably even find yourself blessed with an insider scoop of all the latest gadgets that you really should think about buying because they will just help you in some fashion. The, the bottom line, you, you know that if a, a woman has recently become pregnant, the conversation is going to circle around baby. Why? Why does this inevitably happen? Why is it that even though I and other men have a whole lot less involvement in the, the birth process, my observation is that oftentimes men will engage in the conversation with almost as much vigor as the women. Why is that? Well, it's because babies are precious. We love babies. They're exciting. We, we naturally marvel at new life. We, we like to take time and focus on, on the wonder of this coming baby. Well, Luke is revealing a, a very similar sentiment in our gospel. He is pausing, spending a lot of space, meaning that, that we will spend a lot of time on the birth of Jesus. We are not rushing past this. Now, of course, Luke is doing it in a way that will cause us to marvel beyond just the fact that there's a new life coming into the world. He is causing us to marvel that the Creator God would enter His creation for the purpose of redeeming His sinful creatures. That's worth pondering. That's worth marveling over. That the Creator God would enter His creation to redeem sinful creatures. That's amazing. Why would God do that? Now you may recall that in the first four verses, the prologue of the gospel, Luke said that his goal in this whole book is to give us the exact truth about Jesus. Those were the words he used, his exact truth. And then he began that, began that exact truth by telling us how this angel Gabriel came and announced to Zacharias that Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth, who were really old, would have a baby. But that was not the baby Jesus. That was the baby John, the one that we would know as John the Baptist. This old priest, as he entered the, the holy section of the temple to offer incense for the people, was told that they would bear a son that would be the forefather of the one that we're really to focus on. Last week we looked at Luke's record where there was a second visit by the angel Gabriel, this time to a young girl named Mary. Mary was betrothed at the time, we were told, but she was still a virgin. Gabriel told her that she would bear a son, a holy child, who would be called the, the Son of God, according to, to verse 35. Mary obviously understood there that, that Gabriel meant that she would conceive a child before any union with her husband-to-be. Her, her response was that she would submit as the Lord's bondservant to whatever he wanted. She was his bond slave. Regardless of what repercussions might come to her uh, being discovered pregnant while unmarried, the Lord could do with her as he chose. Well, this morning, Luke continues this lingering he has around the events that they are connected to but actually still precede the, the birth of Jesus. I mentioned last week that 
Jerry has a lot of songs to choose from around the topics of, of these sermons, but in a sense he doesn't because all of our songs deal with the birth itself. Luke's lingering on the lead up to the birth. He's drawing out this part of Jesus' life so that we will continue to marvel at both God's plan and God's actions. God planned this and then he did this. Specifically, he's lingering over a couple of times today where celebration occurs. Mary is pregnant. That's worth celebrating. Jesus is going to come. And he's going to mean something. The, the first celebration that we want to look at today is found in verses 39 through 45 of Luke chapter 1. And in these verses here, we observe that Jesus is celebrated as the fulfillment of God's promise to Mary. God promised she would have a child. We celebrate that promise as it's fulfilled. You, you may recall that Mary told or Gabriel, rather, told Mary that her relative Elizabeth, this old woman that is somehow related to Mary, that she was now pregnant. Mary would know enough about her relative to know that she's well past childbearing age. But Gabriel says, this is the sign that nothing is impossible with God. Apparently, hearing that Elizabeth was pregnant, that, that motivated Mary to visit. Notice Luke begins the words there in verse 39 with, Now... At this time, he's linking these counts together. The, the word that Mary got from Gabriel and this action are connected. Verse 39, Now at this time, Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country, to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, <coughs> excuse me, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. For how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is he who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Mary obviously doesn't waste any time visiting Elizabeth. The angel, when he told Mary last week that Elizabeth was pregnant, he, he said that she was in her sixth month. Now, now, we don't know exactly where Zacharias and Elizabeth lived, but it was somewhere, we're told, in the hill country of Judah. That, that means Mary had traveled south, a, a fair distance from Nazareth down to wherever they lived in the hill country of Judah. As soon as she reaches her destination, she enters the house and she greets Elizabeth. You know, Zacharias, he's never mentioned here, other than the fact that it's his house, he owns the house. Is that because he's unable to speak currently due to his unbelief? Or is it just because women will naturally interact with each other? I, I don't know. At, at any rate, Mary greets Elizabeth, and Luke records that immediately, Elizabeth's baby leaps in her womb. Zacharias was told by Gabriel back in verse 15, that the baby his wife would have would be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. Now we're informed that Elizabeth, his wife, is also filled with the Holy Spirit. And that filling of the Holy Spirit, that allows her to interpret the baby's movement. You know, I admit, a baby moving in a womb is an amazing thing. Now, I remember watching both of our children when they were moving in, in Grace's womb. It, it was obvious that there was an independent creature here inside of her because she wasn't motivating that, that movement. Sometimes it looked like the baby was doing gymnastics. My, my wife used to, to say that she, think, she thought they were practicing for a trampoline act of some kind and her bladder served as their practice trampoline. You know... My point is, there, there's nothing unusual about a baby moving in the womb. But apparently, John's movement here in the womb of his mother, Elizabeth, was not that normal movement. There was something unique about it. There was something significant. The, the word that's used for he leaped in the womb is the same word that's used all the way back in Genesis 25, verse 22, 
to translate into the, the Greek version that, that would have been very familiar to Luke, what happened in Rebekah's womb? Rebekah had twins, remember? Jacob and Esau were in her womb. And in Genesis 25, 22, it's, this word is used to describe the struggle that she felt within her wombs that was so unnatural that she inquired of the Lord and the Lord told her, you have two nations living within you. And that Jacob, the younger, would become the dominant nation. So, in a similar fashion now, Elizabeth's baby is moving in a way that's so unusual that she immediately knows it indicates something significant. And then the Holy Spirit informs Elizabeth what the significance is. The Holy Spirit informs her that her unborn child is leaping for joy at the arrival of Mary because Mary is bearing a special child in her womb. Even before Mary tells Elizabeth anything about what has happened. Now there's a couple important things to note here in these verses. One, th this reference to the, the fruit of your womb when Elizabeth refers to Mary, that, that indicates that Mary is pregnant at this point. Now when, the ga when Gabriel informed Mary of Elizabeth's pregnancy, as I said, Elizabeth was already in the sixth month. When we come to our final verse this morning, we'll find that Mary visits for three months and then leaves, it seems like just before the birth of John, or at least we'd be coming up to that point, right? So if you do the math, she's there for three months, Elizabeth was three months, that tells us that Mary left almost immediately because we're still in the same time frame, even though she's traveled down to see Elizabeth. Mary came so quickly that she is pregnant now, but there's no way her pregnancy was showing. Elizabeth is informed by the Holy Spirit that she's pregnant. The second thing I want to note is, see where Elizabeth calls Mary the, the mother of my Lord. How is it that the mother of my Lord would come to me? There in verse 43. This is the first time that, that Jesus is given the title Lord in the Gospel of Luke. The Lord, Lord, L-O-R-D like that, the, the Greek word that's used, that, that's the, the, the way that God's covenant name is frequently translated in the Greek version of the Old Testament. That covenant name of God was translated by the Greek word kurios. And Kyrios is the, the word that's used here. By, by the time Luke was writing, people were used to seeing Lord and thinking of God. Technically, the word just, you probably, many of you know, means master. But it was used to translate God so often that people just read it that way. Much like when you read the Old Testament and you see Lord, you instinctively think God, right? We, we do that all the time. Even though... Even in English, Lord means master. Luke picks up this title and he uses it for Jesus to highlight the special relationship between God and Jesus. An emphasis that he's going to make all the way through his gospel. Elizabeth recognizes that Mary is carrying my Lord in her womb. The, the Holy Spirit informs her of this truth. And she immediately calls Mary blessed. She says, blessed are you among women. E Elizabeth is really saying that Mary is the most blessed woman ever. That's that, that phrasing, blessed are you among women, that, that's a, a, Hebraic way, a Hebrew way of saying you are the most blessed woman ever, blessed among any other woman. And blessed, this word, it's a state of being. It's not a feeling that the Mary would experience. Elizabeth is not telling her, you should feel great about what God has done you. She said, no, you are the most blessed among women. She is blessed. She is the one who will be praised by others because she is the mother of the Lord. Furthermore, look at verse 45. Mary is blessed because she believed what was promised to her by the Lord. Clearly this time in verse 45, Lord has to mean God the Father, right? 
It cannot mean Jesus, the one that's in her womb, because God sent Gabriel to reveal to her that she would be the mother of Jesus. And she believed what was spoken to her by the Lord. She believed that this unborn child was the Lord. She is blessed. In verse 42, a different word is used, though, than is used in verse 45. In verse 45, this word blessed means she is favored or fortunate. Verse 42, the word means she'll be praised. She'll be lifted up. She'll be praised. She'll be exalted as the most favored of women. This word means that she was favored. She was the fortunate one. She was favored by God. Luke is really saying that, that she is fortunate because the faith that she displays by God when God promised to give her a child, that faith displays God's favor upon her. Not just the child that she's carrying shows God's favor, but her faith, her belief that, that God would give the child. The fact that she believed that God would do what he said he would do is a sign of God's favor already upon her. God is magnified through this child, and her faith displays that. This child, Jesus, he is the one celebrated because God is fulfilling his promise to Mary. You know, the speaker at our men's retreat the, this past couple days made this point yesterday, and I want to pass it along. He asked, what woman in all of Scripture has the most unexpected pregnancy? And if you think about it for a while, there are a lot of candidates that you could place to that answer that question. Which woman is the most unexpected? I mean, we can go all the way back to Sarah, right? Abraham's wife, who was barren, far past the age of childbearing. And then she's told, you'll have a son to a man who's really old. Then you have Rebecca, the very next generation. I mentioned uh, chapter 25, verse 22 a moment ago. Well, the previous verse before that tells us Rebecca was barren, and then God opened her womb. A miracle occurred there unexpectedly. Generation later, repeat with Rachel. Jake, Jacob's favored wife is barren for years and suffers great ridicule and, and, and great sorrow over it until suddenly God finally remembers her and opens her womb and she has Joseph. Several centuries later, you can think of Hannah. Repeat story with Samuel, right? He, again, another barren woman who suffered scorn by a, a, another wife to her husband for not being able to bear children. And then comes Samuel. Right and in this passage, we're dealing with Elizabeth, old woman bearing a child to an old man. Again, far past the age of childbearing, which is the most unexpected. These are all miracles. And yet the most unexpected pregnancy of all Though the one that absolutely, positively, humanly is impossible is the pregnancy of a virgin. Go all the way back to Sarah and think of all these others. All of these were pointing toward the most great accomplishment in the world of pregnancy that God could do, giving a baby to a virgin. Mary's pregnancy demonstrates the truth of the statement that nothing is impossible with God. God's miraculous fulfillment of his promises to Mary, despite how unexpected they, the, the fulfillment was, and despite how impossible the fulfillment was, led to this celebration that we're observing here of Jesus. Jesus is celebrated at the fulfillment of God's promise to Mary. This is what we observe here as Mary arrives for her visit with Elizabeth. As Luke continues to record things about this event, he picks one other thing that happens during the, the time that Mary's with Elizabeth. And he records another celebration. Jesus is celebrated as the fulfillment of God's promise to Israel. His promise to Israel. God, Luke next records here a praise that, that 
Mary makes to God. Uh, a praise that expresses her celebration of her pregnancy. The, this praise is in the form of a song and is often referred to as the Magnificat. That's because the, the very opening word of praise in the old Latin version is the word Magnificat. And the song's taken on that name over the centuries. You may see it if you have New American Standard. It's the heading over it. Mary did not express herself in Latin, but she certainly expressed herself with a lot of Old Testament language. Reading at verse 46, And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regard for the humble state of his bondservant. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of his heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants, forever. And Mary stayed with her about three months and then returned to her home. One of the first things that strikes us as we read this song here from Mary is, is the humble tone that, that she has as she expresses her praise to God. When, when Gabriel spoke to Mary in, in the verses last week, we... we saw that she responded with a reference to herself as God's bond slave. I mentioned that the word that she used means female slave. She is just God's slave. She, she now uses that same word again in verse 48 to describe herself. She is God's slave. He can do with her as he chooses. She is there to serve him entirely. That's all she exists for is to serve God. By the way, I do want to point out that, that Mary's opening humble words refute Roman Catholic, um, con, I'll call it confusion, it's part of their doctrine, but it's confusion, where they claim that Mary was in some way sinless. Notice Mary starts out rejoicing in my Savior. She rejoices in God, my Savior. Mary needed a Savior. A, a sinless person does not need a Savior. A, a sinless person does not need a Savior. In fact, the reason we gather here today is because a sinless person can be a Savior. And there's only been one sinless person. Mary's humble tone here is obvious. Yet humility does not prevent Mary from, from recognizing reality. She, she recognizes that, just as Elizabeth had stated earlier, she is uniquely blessed. What, what God has done for her is so great that every generation forward will consider her blessed. That's not because of any intrinsic worth in Mary. It's not because she is special in any way in herself. She is blessed because God has given her this child. In her virgin condition, she is pregnant with the one who will be the holy son of God. It's hard to imagine a person will ever be graced by God to a greater degree than, than Mary was graced. And, and for that reason, she's happy to be remembered because God is great. God has done great things for her. God is worthy of being celebrated for what he has done in her. Now, I'm drawing this out a little bit because there's an application here for all of us. We, too, have been graced by God. God has done great things for us. God has granted us a Savior. If we've accepted Jesus, we are truly graced by God. After all, we all say we're, sin by grace, we're saved by grace alone. And we say it because it is the fundamental truth of our salvation. We did nothing to earn our salvation. It was all by God's grace. And then add to that, God graces us over and over again with, with countless blessings. 
Forgive me for a moment. I'm going to get on my soapbox and deal with one of my pet peeves. It drives me crazy when we have praise services and, and some of you will not get up and share the great things that God has done for you. You, you, you oftentimes will feign humility. But I'm going to call you out. It's not humility. It's pride. It's pride because you're concerned about what people might think about what you say. That they might look at you and say, oh, that wasn't expressed very well or that's not a big thing. Or maybe they'll say, well, they really looked funny as they started crying over what God has done for them. Sharing what God has done to you is not about you. It's about God. Let me in on a little secret. I know you're not great. We all know you're not great. God is great. God is great and God has done great things and we deserve to hear that God is great. We deserve to share with one another because God is great. We want to celebrate God. We don't want to celebrate you. I want to celebrate God. Mary knows that God has done great things for her. She praises him for that now and, and obviously she stated it publicly so that Luke years later could record this song. She records it so that future generations will praise God for what he has done in her. Displaying true humility because she knows it's not about her. Yet she's unique because what God has done is what only God can do. God is holy. God is merciful. God is eternal. So generation after generation after generation experience the great and mighty deeds of God. And in particular, she says, God has done great things through her for Israel. And as she thinks about Israel, she starts thinking back through the generations of Israel. For generation after generation after generation, God has done great things for Israel. One of the, the interesting things about God's great deeds is that what God does tends to upend the, the values and expectations of humanity. Look at some things she lists. We, we would expect rulers to be exalted. I mean, right now we have two men running for president in our country. Who are those men exalting? And who do those men want exalted? We expect rulers to be exalted. But God has brought rulers down and exalted those who were humble. We would expect the rich to have enough. But God sent the rich away empty-handed and has filled the hungry. God does do the expected at times, but God also does the unexpected, at least as far as the world's concerned. Certainly Mary here sees herself as a prime example, maybe the prime example of God's unexpected approach to doing great things. Who would have ever thought a virgin would give birth to a baby? She certainly did not expect to experience something that no other girl had ever experienced. This young girl did not expect to be singularly unique among mankind. Yet now that she finds herself in a unique position, she recognizes the reason is entirely consistent with God's unexpected pattern. God does what we don't expect. He is a God who shows mercy to those who don't deserve mercy. He, he's a God who shows mercy to, to those he has promised to show mercy toward. They don't deserve it. But when God promises it, he does it. And as she, she thinks about that, Israel fits both those categories. Israel did not deserve mercy. Israel was filled, their history books. We know they're Israel's history books. They're given to us. We have the Old Testament. The history books are filled with rebellions against God. Generation after generation of hard-heartedness is revealed. Rather than submit to God, Israel collectively shook their metaphorical fist in God's face time and time again. At the same time, God had made a covenant with Israel. He has a relationship with them. They were his people. 
He's promised to help them. He promised to preserve them. He promised to care for them. He chose Abraham and promised Abraham that, Abraham, your descendants will be a special people forever. Yes, the, the rest of the people of the world would experience God's blessings too, but they would experience God's blessings through Israel. Israel would have a Messiah. As we're seeing this evening in our, well actually for some time now in our evening service, but again particularly this evening, Israel will find salvation through the Messiah. And Israel's Messiah will save people from other nations. All to show the greatness of God. Last week I mentioned that while Jesus is clearly the center of the story, it's right to admire Mary's example of submission to God's plan in our lives. She, she gives us an example that, that's worthy of emulation. Well, her example of praise is worthy of emulation as well. We should praise God that he is faithful to his covenantal promises. We, we should apply that specifically to Israel. We should be grateful that God would be faithful to his covenant promises to Israel. We should rejoice that God did not abandon Israel. That, that God did not do to Israel what they truly deserved. We should rejoice that instead God sent a Messiah through Israel. We should praise God for his mercy, specifically his mercy on Israel. Sometimes I think we forget that, that our hope is tied to God's mercy to Israel. After all, we're, we're rather self-centered people. Even when we humble ourselves enough to praise God, we're still praising God for what God has done for us. We, we can't help it. We're, self, we're self-centered because our perceptions revolve around what we perceive. We're, so we praise God for things he's done for us. And we're not Israel. Yet were it not for Israel, we would not have a Savior. Were it not for God's mercy, both to Israel and us, because we don't deserve anything more than Israel deserves, were it not for God's mercy, we would not have a Savior. If God was not merciful on Israel, we would have no Savior. We have a Savior because, using the words there, verse 45, because he remembered Israel. He remembered his mercy. He remembered his promise of mercy toward Israel. And Jesus was conceived. The, the picture that comes in my mind here is a little bit about like that of a flood that suddenly sweeps down a valley when a dam breaks. I'm sure we've all seen pictures of, of that happening where a dam suddenly bursts and the water just flows down the valley and sweeps away everything that's in its path. I think of God's mercy a little bit that way. Israel's sin kind of damned up God's blessings for a period. But God's not going to be undone by a simple thing like sin. So God burst through that dam by bringing Christ. And even though we were far from the water, when that water suddenly burst into the valley and flowed away, we just got picked up and flowed along with it, swept away by the mercy of God. God remembered his promise toward Israel. And his mercy overflowed that dam of their sin and it flowed through the Messiah. And here we are, swept up in that overflow even though we are not Israel. God recognized that, or, or Mary rather, recognized that the God was doing a great work through her, but that great work was for the entire nation. Because God is great and merciful. And as she recognized that, she offers this magnificent song, the, this Magnificat. And, and then, after three months, Mary left Israel and returned home to Nazareth. As I said earlier, mathematically, this places her departure right at the time of John's birth. And the fact that Luke records John's birth as the next event re suggests that Mary left just before he was born. I have no idea why she might have done so, but Luke doesn't tell us because the focus is on her celebration of her baby and how that baby fulfills God's promises to Israel. Jesus is celebrated for 
the fulfillment of God's promise to Israel. We observe the celebration here in this song. So we've seen two celebrations this morning. Two celebrations. Jesus is celebrated for God's fulfillment, or the fulfillment of God's promise to Mary, and then his promise to Israel. Both fulfillments are worthy of celebration, but what can we learn? Again, we're not Israel. What can we learn? Let's, let's ask that question as we close. What can we learn from these celebrations? As God fulfills his promise to Mary and to Israel. Well, look at both celebrations. The focus is Jesus. The focus is Jesus. God has done something for Mary named Jesus. God has done something for Israel named Jesus. And Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise to both. That tells us that he should be our focus too. We can celebrate that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promises. That's how we bring it to us. We're not Israel, but Jesus is the fulfillment of all of God's promises. And we can celebrate Jesus. Jesus demonstrates that God can do the impossible, just as God has promised. Jesus is the Savior that God's promised. Jesus is the one that we can celebrate. How? We can celebrate that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise. How do we celebrate Jesus? Well, for one thing, we, we have to get to know him. We can't celebrate someone we don't know. Have any of you been invited to a, a party for, especially a parent, you probably experienced this, for a party for one of your children's friends? It's kind of hard to celebrate that friend's celebration that you don't know at all. Yes, your child knows, so they're celebrating, but it's hard for you to get really excited, so you go and talk with other mothers or other fathers or parents. We need to get to know Jesus. We cannot celebrate one we do not know. Knowing Jesus has to begin with knowing him as our personal Savior. We have to understand that we are sinners deserving an eternal damnation. We deserve hell for all eternity because we have sinned against the holy God. But God in love sent Jesus. And Jesus in love went to the cross and died, paying the penalty that our sins rightly deserved. And by faith, we come to God asking him to accept Jesus' payment in our place. And by faith, we trust that God will do exactly that because God has promised to do exactly that. By the way, if you're here today and you do not know Jesus as Savior, talk to me. After the service, I'll be in the lobby. Talk to me there. Send me an email. Let me share with you how you can know Jesus as your personal Savior because knowing him begins there and we cannot celebrate one we do not know. So if you're here today and you do not know Jesus, talk to me. But knowing Jesus cannot end with knowing him as our personal Savior. Jesus is the holy God the Holy Son of God. We, we have to know him as the Son of God who is holy. And knowing him in this sense requires what we would call the study of doctrine. Some of you, the moment I say doctrine, start getting hives. Get over it. You need to know doctrine because doctrine just means we know what God has said about himself. We need to know Jesus. We need to learn what God has revealed about himself. That means that then we will come to know him as Lord. Remember, Lord means master, not simply God. We will come to know him as the one who governs our life. Knowing him this way requires spending time with him in a relationship. We need to have ongoing conversations with God. That means spending time in his word where we know him. It means spending time in prayer, communing with him. Spends time meditating, thinking about how what he has said applies to our lives. It requires ongoing conversations with other Christians about Jesus who will help us see things we haven't seen. It requires a conscious commitment to submit himself 
ourselves to him. To submit ourselves to him as bond slaves. Celebrating Jesus takes some work. But we can celebrate him. We can celebrate Jesus because he is the fulfillment of God's promises. Frankly, celebrating Jesus allows us to become what we were intended to be as image bearers from the beginning. So celebrating Jesus is worth the work. Uh, I would suggest once more that, that celebrating also means telling others about Jesus. Within the church, as I've already suggested today, that means telling others about Jesus in the form of the great works that he's done for us. Without the work, or without the church, outside the church, that means telling people of the great works that Jesus has done in our lives. You know, it's the same message. We tell each other what Jesus has done and we tell people outside what Jesus has done. Sure, our language may change a little bit, how we approach it. When we talk to people within the church about what Jesus has done, the great works that God has done through Jesus in our lives, we may have some shared experience we can draw on. We may have a common vocabulary we can use. When we tell people outside the church about the great works that Jesus has done, we may have to use a different set of vocabulary because, frankly, unless they know Jesus as Savior, they don't have the shared experience. But we can certainly tell them about the hope they can share with us because Jesus is available. We can tell about a baby who grew up to be our Savior in fulfillment of God's promises. We celebrate Jesus. Babies are exciting. When we hear about one, we rejoice. We stop and marvel that life is coming. Luke wants us to marvel about the baby who is coming. The baby that is greater than any other baby. The one who is worthy of all of our celebrations. He's encouraging us to stop and marvel at Jesus. Because we can celebrate that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promises. Father, I pray that you would help us to truly celebrate your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. May we come to know him. May we come to love him more as we celebrate him. And may that love overflow as we proclaim the great things that you have done through him in our lives. We pray this in his glory, his wonderful, marvelous, saving name. Amen. Thank you.